Internationally, convertible bonds are widely used uh, by corporate companies to raise capital. Their yield is often lower than a normal bond in s the same class, but this is because conversion is possible. Once conversion occurs, the convertible bond holder becomes a normal company shareholder. How many of these bonds are available in the market today and how do investors make uh, use of this asset class? Gentlemen, welcome to this program. Thank you. Much appreciated you. for your time. Simon, let's start off with you. I've given sort of a definition in a sense, but I'd like for you to actually uh, take the ball right now and, and show us exactly what a convertible bond is, bond is and what it means right now in the global financial system. A convertible bond is really, an investor has a choice. He wants a coupon, but he also wants some upside. So therefore he wants a convertible bond is a very good instrument where you're looking to limit your downside risk and behave like a debt instrument all the way, but you have some equity upside. And in return for that, you normally give up a coupon, a bit of the coupon that you would normally get relative to uh, uh, a normal debt instrument. But uh, on the other hand, sometimes the, the, the pricing of the equity is where your upside lies. If it's, price, if it's mispriced, i.e. if your equity is around a share, and you have a conversion option at one rand thirty. That's what they normally do. So there's a discount to the there's a premium to the current market. That's the normal standard convertible bond, and it it became very um, fashionable for hedge funds and especially hedge arbitrage funds overseas, where they would go and buy the convertible, go long on the convertible, and short on the ordinary equity if it was mispriced because they're getting a coupon to hold to hold something where they're getting the equity upside. And uh, to make it simple, think of a convertible car, okay? And, you know, convertible is the nice thing about it. When it's good weather, you open the roof, and when it's bad weather, it behaves like a car. So effectively, a bond in bad weather behaves like a car. In good weather, should behave, give you the equity upside. Okay, I mean, I, you know, that's, I mean those, are the, those are the attributes, I mean, I think about a convertible bond. But the issue that you've got, in, like, for instance, in South Africa, is the acceptance of convertible bonds. I think the big thing that you've got in South Africa at the moment is the fact that there's not too many of them available in South Africa. Maybe, Simon, you can give us an indication. How many of these are available here in South Africa? You know, the top 40 companies recently, there have been two or three convertibles, but they've gone straight to the international market. So they haven't even listed in South Africa. Most of the convertible bond type transactions have been done in the unlisted space or alternatively by big entrepreneurs or management of companies who wanted to buy into companies and and here I think of the the, the classic one that was done a couple of years ago when Didata was in um, there was some financial trouble with Didata they didn't want to go for a rights issue so because their share was undervalued they thought and um, Venfin under the Rembrandt regime bought in for a hundred million dollar convertible uh, a bond, they took a convertible and then they could exercise obviously at a price. Is this a lack of appetite, the fact that we haven't seen many convertible well, bonds in South Africa? Is it a lack of knowledge? I think, Why it's, is it so I think our pension fund histor historically have basically been long only mandates and enlisted mandates or um, debt mandates, long only enlisted debt mandates. Now a convertible for one of those guys who've got a mandate, where does a convertible fit in? Okay, and then regulation 28 has sort of opened that up a bit. Because a convertible bond is probably, I would say, unlisted debt for South Africa. So in to other start words, with. it falls into the allowance of 10% now no. to all the unregulated space. No, where does that's it where in? they thought it would uh, would fit in. But after Reg 28 came out, it appeared, and based on legal opinion, for, to the pension, someone who's um, well known to the pension fund industry, she stated that effectively it falls under the debt unlisted debt because we we're talking about unlisted convertibles, not listed convertibles, and. Under the unlisted debt, you can actually put 25% of a pension fund's money into unlisted debt. Roland, uh, the risks within convertible bonds, let's touch on that. How do you ascertain the risks? And given the fact that there's such a huge allowance for pension funds in, within the space. Um, I, I guess the first thing is that you're not getting the kind of interest rate you would normally get from a, a, a government bond or a, a corporate bond. Um, but there are benefits, obviously, to a convertible that uh, one has to take into account. But in terms of the risks, um, you, uh, you have to understand that the, the payoff you're getting over time uh, can be sort of jumpy in the sense that it's conditional on certain events. So at certain points in the share price movement, certain things happen. So there's an optionality in this kind of uh, payoff. So before you get to the conversion price, it behaves like a bond. And when the share price goes above the certain share price, you have the, the option to, to, to convert it to, to stock and then obviously your payoff is different. So it's not a smooth kind of payoff, and, and I guess uh, one, one needs to understand that, and, and, and that's a key risk. But something else maybe I can ask Simon is, um, the sky is not necessarily the limit with a, with a convertible bond because you are getting upside with a share price, but some 
convertible bonds are callable, right? So the, yes. the company can actually yeah. prevent uh, you from benefiting from too the much. share price I, going I, up I look at much. a convertible bond and I compare it to sort of, on the one hand, have, you have the pure mezzanine debt, and then on the other hand, you have the private equity. And I, we tend to sit in the middle. We won't make as much money on a private equity as private equity. If you put in, if your company needed 100 million rand in it, and let's say 50 million rand would bring you 50%, a convertible might put in 50 million rand on a convertible basis, but probably only end up with 35% of the equity. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they would be getting a yield, which a private equity guy wouldn't be getting. Mm -hmm. And if you structure your convertible bonds properly, and they can be structured because each one is a separate agreement. Mm -hmm. So it varies. You can't have a, it's not a standard, you know, not everyone is standard. It's a tailor-made It's payoff. a tailor-made payoff. And you can also have a capital upside, a, a redemption premium. So if the company redeems you, you want a premium, which will give you your return, but it's all back-ended. So your interest rate, your coupon you get, but the rest of it could be back-ended at the, at the end of the period where you get your kicker. It's not as you're going along. Kobe, are there certain times in the cycle that you want to own and have exposure to convertible bonds, or is it across the board? Would you like exposure throughout every single economic yeah. cycle? Well, that's, I, mean, I think that's an interesting question, Eleni. Uh, what I, what I want to do is I want us to look at the screen at the moment, because um, what, I've, what we've got here is we've got uh, the MSCI World Index relative to the UBS Global Convertible Index in Euro. It's the hedged <coughs> version of that, various, and then the Merrill Lynch Global Broad uh, Bond Index. We rebase the graph to 100, and we go back to 1996, and you can kind of have a look at the performance numbers that you see kind of happening over time there. And there you can see uh, the, the, the bond index. And you can see the slow rise in bonds over time. And I mean, that's what you expect from bonds over time. But then look at, its, look at the equity attributes. There's MSCI World. And you can, see how, you can see how volatile the MSCI World is. And you can see how it drops in value and then rises and drops again. Whereas relative to its UBS Global Convertible Bond Index, you can see how that potentially doesn't have the downside that equities have over here because you've got the kind of a yield kind of, kind of focus as far as this thing is concerned. And then, um, you know, as the, as the market continues to increase and increase, I would only assume that quite a few of these things are converting into stocks. So you actually become a stockholder. And then as the market kind of comes down, you see kind of the bond attributes are kind of, you know, uh, becoming evident again. You can kind of see the outperformance there. So a very different type of asset class. If you look at the attributes for this asset class, it's got equity type characteristics, but then it's got bond type characteristics as well. Well, and it's interesting, uh, just in terms of when it was underperforming from the 96 period to around, say, 99 uh, convertible bond index relative to the MSCI world. What, why did it underperform there? Yeah, Simon. Yes, well, it, well um, I'm just, you, relative to, yeah, because it would, because the equity optionality would have been taken out of it. Because mm -hmm. as your price goes down, let's assume you're sitting at 100 Rand. Mm -hmm. uh, your, op, your strike price is 100 Rand. It's only slight underperformance, but still, it's, it's quite But that noticeable. could be the, depending on, you know, they, they use lots of volatility and all that to determine what price your strike price is of your, mm -hmm. conver of your conversion. And if you're, if, if you, let's say you issue a bond at 100 Rand and the share price goes to up to 130, which is your strike price, and then goes to 150, your convertible bond between that 130 and 150 will move with the, with the, mm -hmm. the market. But as soon as it comes below that or drops, there's no optionality in it. You've lost that, that profit. See, it's a share. It's, it's a share. A, it then it, it, it sort it, of behaves like a share. Yeah, and it will have the... S sort of more downside than it would normally have. And, th and um, then when it, when it comes down, it should behave like a bond, effectively. And hence, at, at if, you point, see yeah. if you see at the downside, it sort of sticks to where the bond curve is because that's behaving normally. But what you found in that index, and it can be confused, there are a lot of arbitrage funds involved. Uh, um, convertible arbitrage. Which arbitrage convertibles? They're arbitrage between the shares. And they're, they're like a hedge fund. And they display convertibles in a hedge fund space uh, internationally. And that can dispute, de mm -hmm. um, determine... Um, the change of the, the profile of the bond. And they, they, they lock in profits, obviously. Yeah, the, the downside here is clearly very limited in the sense that if the share price goes to nothing, at the end of the, the period, you are going to get the original amount you invested plus an interest uh, payment over time. So it is a bond payoff when things go very badly. And it is like an equity when things go well, but obviously when things go well, there could be short periods of high volatility which will affect the, the, the return of that uh, equity component. So it sounds like a very attractive asset class. It, it, it is a very attractive so asset why class. Why isn't it gaining traction well, in South Africa? You know, you've, in order f it, for anything to gain traction, and the reason we were, when we originally started out on this, we were going to go into private equity, and then we saw yeah. there was no appetite between fund b by fund managers for 
convertibles. They couldn't, they weren't allowed to invest in them. So if you can't allow it, if you're not allowed to invest in it, no company can go and raise money for it because no one can invest in it through the through our industry. Mm -hmm. So, but that's changed now. Well, it's no, it's still in the process of changing. It hasn't changed. It's still there, and that's what a lot of what we're doing at the moment is talking to asset allocators, talking to fund managers, and talking and through the asset allocators, talk to the pension funds to say, guys, there is another asset class, and I I, I do it in a simple way. If if a proper company's balance sheet should be 50% debt, okay, bonds, and 50% equity. That's how they should raise their money and operate. I'm saying, look, isn't there a situation of 40% debt, 40% equity, and 20% convertibility? So this financial director has some optionality. Because often you need to raise money, and your share price, your company might be over undervalued. So you'd want to put in a convertible so that they only become equity when the price is fair in, from an equity value. So Simon, that, are, yeah. are you saying that there's, there's two roles here, obviously as a debt instrument, in other words, a corporate finance kind Absolutely. of instrument, and then there's an investment long-term pension fund kind of Absolutely. argument here. Yes. Um, and this market hasn't seen the latter, but seen them sort of for, for doing deals. I think the banks have used them. Banks have used them over the years, and, but the banks often would use PREFs rather than convertible bonds because of the dividend. Whereas a, the bond interest is tax deductible for the company because it's interest, whereas a PREF dividend mm -hmm. So it's a yield. So banks have generally used preference shares in their deals, and they've never needed to because, you know, if you're going to lend money to someone and you can get an equity stake, you're not going to give it to the pension fund industry. Yeah. You're not going to give it to the retailer. That's where the banks make their profit. So historically, that's been a big area of banking where they go into convertibles, into unlisted companies as another form of sort of quasi-debt debt instrument. Let's look at a, I, I want to I wanna look at a specific issuance because, um, I mean, it might be quite interesting. Here's a, here's a deal that was done in August, the inception date for it is August 2010, and in essence what you're looking at over here is you're looking at, um, you're looking at a convertible bond. You've got a choice as an investor when you get to the conversion rate. You could either hold it until, uh, until maturity, and you can see the first one there on the screen, you convert it into ordinary shares, and you could basically obviously also choose how much you want to convert. You want to con convert some of it, you want to convert all of it. Um, that's, that's a choice that you have as an investor at the end of the day. Let's look at the payoff profile. As I say, this is an actual deal that has actually happened in the unlisted space. And let's just have a look at that. Sorry, Simon. Quibi, can I just say that deal was a purchase of a convertible bond that had been issued by a company who had got it, but he needed to raise cash mm. quickly. So they used their convertible bond that they were issued in a different deal mm. to raise the cash. Mm. So that's how we bought. We, Can we get we insight into the company, and what was that? What? I think I, th I think I think that that might be difficult. Okay. That that what? might be difficult. But let's look at the returns. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's I think that's important here. Matters, yeah. Okay. So if you sold the hundred percent in October twenty ten, so that's only a couple of months later. So you converted it all into shares and you sold 100%, there you can see the internal rate of return for it, you know, just beyond 50%. That's an annualized internal rate of return. The actual return would have been probably close to about 18. 10, 18%. It was 18%, percent, but it was between percent. 14 and 18%, the guys who did it then, yeah. And you can see that the biggest payoff profile, you obviously get quite late in December 2010, and that is if you then converted 100% into shares, and you can see the massive upside that you would have got there from an internal rate of return perspective. The other ones, obviously, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with those. You can see if you sold 50%, a different payoff profile, if you sold 50% in December 2010, again, also kind of a, a different payoff remember profile. The, the, remember the, the reason for those um, uh, long-term, you're holding the rest for three years. Mm. So you've kept the long-term. If you sell 50% now, you got your equity immediately, you cashed in, and you kept the rest in a convertible mode, which gave you a good re return. These bonds were yielding 11% coupon. Mm. So, so that was a great return. How easy is it to get in and out of convertible bonds? Uh, and, no. and Very, uh, You only can get out of them in South Africa at the moment, okay, you normally have to take them, would have to take them yield to maturity because they're not listed. So the only way you could get out of them is if they either redeem, they pay you the money back, or alternatively you have the conversion is into a listed and company. And in between the company, I don't know, defaults? Uh, well, okay, that's, then what? Uh, no, that's a very good question, and that's why I like convertible debt. Because if a company defaults, okay, you have the same rights and obligation, or same rights as a bondholder. So effectively, whereas if you've got equity, and the company defaults, you've lost everything. Whereas as a bondholder, you go for your security. And that's why, for, for someone of my age, if you asked me where, if I'm gonna run a, a fund or do something, where would I want to put my money in? Uh, I said I wanted to put it in convertible bonds, why? Because it gives me a return and I get the equity upside at the end. Mm -hmm. And what's more, if the company fails, if you've done a good job and got a security, you can then go for your mm -hmm. security of assets and you stand mm -hmm. first in the queue. Mm -hmm. And okay. that's why unlisted is better. Yeah, I think these things are very valuable. The, the toss-up, I think, in South Africa is 
um, from an investment perspective and from a fund manager perspective is that uh, they have a choice. They've, they can go for government bond, they can perhaps go for corporate bonds, they can go for inflation linked bonds which are very popular as investment vehicles and then there's obviously the convertible bonds. So there is a whole palette um, and, and I would like to see more of these in portfolios. Right, right. on that note we're going to a very short break and when we come back we take a look at convertible bonds and uh, some of its features.